Thank you very much for having me. Um, first of all, Dr. Chapman, that was spectacular. Uh, I still use your alphabet soup to describe to our residents on how to, uh, to, to do lumbar laminectomies and all these, because right when I started as an attending, the first thing they would say is, I was like, how do you know where to drill? They say, well, till we see ligament. And, you know, that's not a very, you know, uh, ec you know, the way Dr. Hamilton described it, it's not economically, you know, good, uh, but nevertheless, thank you, Dr. Chapman, and rest assured, I am giving you credit every time I use that. So, um, I've been tasked with uh, describing some, some of the lumbar uh, anatomy, but I'm going to go a little bit through the history quickly. Spine surgery uh, has gone way before uh, our esteemed faculty here. Uh, it started back way in the Greek and Egyptians. They had some sort of uh, suspicion that there was a relationship between spine pathology and leg symptoms. However, our surgical treatment did not really develop until the 1970s, but there were some surgeons back in the 11th century that described some surgical disorders and recommended use of chemical or thermal cauterization um, and some even developed as abolicosis, who I can't pronounce correctly, but I'm sure Dr. Chapman will correct me, um, has developed a device to reduce the uh, dislocated spine. Now, as we come closer to our, our current times, Dr. Dandy uh, and uh, Cushing had some early lumbar canal exploration in the late 1800s and 1900s. And he, they were also joined by some of their uh, colleagues uh, is Dr. Horsley, Taylor, uh, amongst others. So the laminectomy, as uh, Dr. Chapman elegantly described, is probably the first final procedure performed, uh, even at this day, many different various permutations, and we could probably spend the next 10 hours discussing how many permutations from the unibi to the micro, you know, from uh, you attacking everything from one side or whatnot. But, you know, the first historical description was actually in 16, 650 AD uh, for what now is known as a laminectomy. So quickly, you know, I, I will tell you, at least when I was in med school, uh, they just uh, pointed at the back of the cadaver and said, figure it out. Um, I know that I didn't really get much. Uh, I actually went in into the lab on my own time when I was a medical student and then obviously uh, when I was a fellow, I spent uh, many, many nights in the lab to, to fully understand how everything comes together. Uh, you know, you look at it, it looks pretty easy when you look at it and there's no bones, there's no skin. You're like, oh, I could kind of figure this out. I could put a pedicle screw in my sleep. But there's a lot of different intricacies. And as we heard uh, some of the previous lectures describe, and I'm sure you've heard a lot of people describe there are two types of spine surgeons. They're the ones that, uh, that cure deformity and those are the ones that create it. And if you don't understand your anatomy and your biomechanics, uh, you may be one or the other. Um, so the, the pretty much the basics are the, the, the joints and you have to understand in what fashion they come out at you. Your spinous process, your transverse process, and obviously your your vertebral bodies uh, that are uh, segmented with your vertebral discs. Um, you know, the bodies are massive, they're robust, but ultimately, once you understand the anatomy of the, the bony anatomy and the soft tissue anatomy, the most basic question that is posed to a, a resident or a med student, when you get down to the lumbar spine is, what nerve are you operating on? And I will tell you the majority, uh, the majority of those people get that wrong. And I don't understand um, what is difficult about it. So, you know, there's a traversing nerve root and, a, and an exiting nerve root, okay? The traversing nerve root is the one that passes by and you see it as it passes by when you're operating on a micro disc. So for instance, at the L4-5 disc, your traversing nerve root is your L5 and your exiting nerve root is your L4. Then a lot of times you may have heard uh, the reference of the Scotty dog. And this is, uh, as you look at your, your sagittal oblique angle, the outline of the facets and the pars has the appearance of a neck of a Scotty dog. And you could sometimes visualize a pars defect on an X-ray. Quickly, as we go through some, uh, some bony, uh, 
variants, you've got your transitional vertebra, you could either have a sacralization of your lowest lumbar segment and a, or a lumbarization of your most uh, superior sacral segment. You can have lumbar uh, ribs. And one of the things this is important is if you do not recognize that, you could potentially operate on the wrong level. Uh, maybe not so if you're operating on the lumbar spine, but if you don't recognize a lumbar rib, you may do so if you're trying to uh, access the lower thoracic spine. Also, uh, some butterfly vertebrae. These are very nice variants. Uh, and these are stuff that, especially as you, as you become a deformity surgeon, you have to recognize it because some of these things will cause deformity or may cause uh, difficulty as you're uh, approaching diff different pathologies. Here we could see a hemi vertebra as well. The soft tissue anatomy, I think, is probably the most important. It's the one uh, that you have to have the biggest understanding of. You do understand that, uh, you do have to understand that it's a three column uh, 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 diagram here. Uh, the anterior column, which is uh, separated from the black line to the red line, uh, is it does include the anterior two thirds and your ALL. This is m very important in deformity, but it's also important in trauma and in oncological surgery. Then you've got your second uh, portion or your middle column, which is from the red to the blue line. And your final column is from the blue line all the way back, including all your posterior column. One thing that we have to understand is when you do your approach, one of the most important things is not uh, hurting your natural uh, anatomy. You know, a lot of times I'll come into a room and people will say, hey, you know, I'm at the level. And then you see a charred mess with all the anatomy uh, gone astray. There's uh, maybe bits and pieces of muscle left. It's very important to elegantly dissect, understand where all the insertion sites are, and possibly even try to reproduce an, uh, the natural anatomy of your support muscles of the lumbar spine because they, you know, as they atrophy, they do cause problems overall. And this is a nice little rendition of an article that uh, we published regarding all the different approaches as the Wiltsy approach, the Weaver, and the Watkins. Um, there's a lot of different muscles and uh, associated with the facets. I'm going to go a little bit faster through here, but uh, Dr. Uh, Chapman very nicely uh, describes some of the, the venous uh, plexi, uh, but ultimately it comes from the Batson who uh, was looking to see how cancers uh, spread from breast, lung, and prostate uh, eventually into the spine. Importantly is the psoas muscle, as we discuss uh, later on in this, uh, in our day about lateral approaches. It, it, it originates from the anterior lumbar uh, vertebral bodies and receives innervation uh, through the lumbar spinal nerves as tiny intrinsics off the femoral nerve. And these will show you all the different axes uh, for your x lift. Okay, the, what's important to understand also is your, um, your psoas will increase in size and diameter as you move down. And he, your lumbar plexus also is there and uh, kind of intertwines with everything. In terms of your vascular anatomy, uh, this is different approaches your, to compare your x lift, your A-lift, and your uh, O-lift in regards to your vascular anatomy and how you have to get around it. Uh, when you decide on an approach, the first thing you should look at are exactly how your anatomy and your vascular anatomy uh, corresponds. For instance, you could, I could show you a, a case that uh, I recently did that I was gonna do laterally. However, the, uh, the the iliac vessels were right under your iliopsoas or where your landing spot would be. So you have to recognize where everything is and you should be able to approach the spine at 360 degrees. In regards to approaching it posteriorly, we discussed the, all the muscles and depending on what you want to do, you're going to, uh, you're going to, uh, you're going to dissect various uh, levels and 
uh, you know, always, you know, as you go back to Chapman's 10 commandments, always make sure that you do the correct side. And the one thing I've always changed from Chapman's, um, 10 commandments is instead of doing the right side, whenever I do a timeout, I just say the correct side, uh, to enhance less confusion. Okay. And then as you, uh, dissect, depending if you're doing a laminectomy or fusion, you dissect off the facet capsule or not depending on what your goal of the procedure is. In terms of an anterior approach, most of us uh, will have our access surgeon do this. Uh, it's nice to understand all the different incisions because the patient will first see you in their office. So you want to describe it to them on how the incision might be. So it's, I always meet with my access surgeons and I know exactly what their uh, MO is so I could give the patient a good understanding. Uh, when you do this, it is through a retroperitoneal approach, or at least you hope to, um, depending on how great your surgeon is. Uh, mine is fantastic and gets me there in, in, in great time. And of course, they push all the organs aside. And I actually have some of these slides in my office to describe it to the, to the patient before uh, they go to see their access surgeon. Uh, and I explain how we retract all the vessels aside. Quickly through the uh, lateral approach, this is a, a patient that we operated on recently. There are many different levels and I encourage you guys to look at uh, all the different uh, anatomy books to understand the levels. The, the unfortunate part about our COVID crisis is we can't play in the lab this year, but hopefully next year we'll all return to the lab so we can all understand all these different levels as we go through. And ultimately you wanna get down to the vertebral bodies uh, and do your, uh, your procedure. Uh, one other important thing, other than looking at your blood vessels, is understanding if your iliac crest is high, especially at your four or five level. There are many different ways around it, but you also don't want to get caught intra-op not understanding where all your anatomy is. So you also uh, have angled access instruments, and we'll discuss that at a later point. And finally, we're just talking about pedicle screws. We've got the Roy Camille technique, which is the most common one uh, to understand, assuming you're not using a robot or navigation. But uh, ultimately, what's very important for all of us is you still have to understand the basics. There is that day that your navigation is going to go out or your robot goes out. So please, please, please understand the basics. And your entry points are at the junction of the lateral margin or the superior facet with a horizontal line in the center of this transverse process. This is preoperative planning. We should all, I don't let anyone do a case with me if they don't have the screws measured and have had some preoperative planning. Uh, and I will tell you, I do that regularly on every single one of my patients. Okay, and this is just a nice x-ray of well-placed screws. Um, and finally, uh, you know, there are different grading systems. Everyone wants a perfect 1A screw, but ultimately you do have to understand what's safe, what's not, and what's impinging on neural elements and if it needs to be changed. And it, the best place to revise is in the first surgery in the operating room not on an oops session, you know, two, three days later. So thank you very much. I appreciate uh, you guys having me here. Uh, I look forward to this course every year. So thank you.